Hey, if you are new with us, um, I just want to quick, brief, tell you who we are. Uh, we are not a perfect church. So let's just start the year out that way. We are not perfect. We don't always have it all together all the time. Uh, but we know a perfect God who has perfectly loved us in his son Jesus, and he has provided a way of salvation, new life, and joy that you have never experienced and can never experience except inside of him. And he's working with us in and through us in our body to create a picture, an image of who he is for this world. And so we gather together. We seek to be a place where faith and fellowship create a family. You saw a sign like that when you came in. Uh, you see that happening. You hear it happening when there are people just talking and talking and talking and talking because we like each other sometimes. And we want to be a place where we can make mistakes, where we can have it not right, we can have hard conversations, and not hide from the things that keep us chained and enslaved, but to be free, to rest and rely on the Lord. That's, that's who we are. Very simple. Jesus loves you. And he loves you deeply. And we want to know him, we want to follow him, we want to serve him with our lives. And so we gather together, we, we sing songs, we, we read God's word with a desire that he would change us. So again, I've, I've said this again, I say these often, like when we start this portion of our service, or rather our gathering, uh, this is not a time to be listening for things for someone else. This is a time where we listen and say, Lord, what do you have to say to me? This world is broken. There is no getting around that. Um, we can, the fact that the news is made to make you scared should just tell you that this world is broken. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of sorrow. And if we can spend a lot of time just opening up into each of your lives, you would see how deep and dark this world is. Now, it's only going to change, not by changing other people, not by changing our circumstances, but it's going to change in how we respond to the place that we are. It's going to change for us as we depend on the Lord. So when we re read his word and we look at it, we go, Lord, what are you saying to me? What in my life do I need to let go of? What in my life do I need to submit to you? What in my life needs to change? What do you need to remind me of? And what do you need to bring to me anew? And we do that. The goals that we have to be this place where faith and fellowship create a family, we'll reach those goals. So we're going to start, we're going to be in chapter 19 of the book of Psalms. And we're going to look at a familiar passage and I'm not going to try to get up here and try to give you something brand new and exciting. My goal here is to give you simple truth. Remind you of some things that you probably already know, but if you don't, man, you got some good news ahead of you. Anyone ready for good news? Yeah. yeah. So if you're going to go to Psalm 19, we're going to read Psalm 19. Psalm 19 is, is really nice because it's broken up into three distinct sections which allows me to do what every preacher likes to do and have three distinct points for their sermon. Um, and we're going to follow that. I'm, I'm going to kind of throw my cards out before you. This psalm talks about God's, uh, how God reveals himself in nature, how he reveals himself in his word, how the revelation of himself in his word is superior to that of nature, and then how, what we are to do in response to that revelation. So that's where we're going. Um, so if you want to fall asleep, you know, that's, that's up to you. Um, but we're going to be there. Psalm, Psalm 19 talks about the authority of God over all of the world, which I think we understand authority somewhat. Um, we don't really like it. Um, it's it's pl almost playoffs, right? Who's the authority on the football field? The stands? <laughs> the fans? Not the fans. Coach? No? 
It's the referees. Vegas. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Um, referees. The referees are the authority on the football field. How, you know how I know? I've seen some really bad calls. And I've been really upset about some bad calls. I've seen some bad calls that I was not that upset about. But I've seen them nonetheless. And you know what happens after that bad call? They keep playing the game based on what was the decision on that bad call. Do you know that bad call doesn't get reversed? Even when Twitter blows up, or it's not even Twitter anymore, X. Even when afterwards everyone's talking about how bad this call was, it doesn't change. Why? Because the ref is an authority over the, what's going on in that game, and everybody has to follow what happens in that game. So we understand authority. There's a greater authority in the world. There's a greater authority in the universe. That authority is God, the triune God. He is an absolute authority over everything. And Psalm 19 speaks clearly to that. So if you have your Bibles and it's already open to Psalm 19, we're going to start reading. And I'm going to read the first six verses. And hopefully in these first six verses, we can find that God's existence and glory is clearly displayed in the immensity of creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims its handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor there are words, nor are there words whose verse voice is not heard. Their voice goes out throughout the whole earth, all the earth, and the wor- and their words to the ends of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. David starts out this psalm pointing to a reality in life. Is as you sit and you start peering into the creation around you, it necessarily should drive you into seeing that there is someone who's put this all together. Creation all around us, our earth, and I don't, we don't spend a lot of time in our modern world looking at creation. We don't spend a lot of time staring at the stars, contemplating. Maybe you do, I don't know, but for most of us, we don't. The sun rises and it sets. Days come, Snow gets predicted, and we get a lot of rain. We keep on moving on. But just sitting and looking at what is out there should draw you to the conclusion that there is something that has created this that is bigger than all of these things. And that something, that someone, is incredibly powerful, incredibly big. You, you can't get away from it unless you resolve to not see it. So he starts out and he says, this, the heavens declare the glory of God. I look at the heavens. I see how vast and majestic they are. I see how much bigger it is than me. There's a God who made that. The sky declares his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. I mean, the poetry there is, is beautiful. If you were to read Hebrew, it, it would be the same word as like a bubbling brook, just constantly bringing out more and more and more and more and more and more. It just keeps speaking and speaking and speaking. Except it doesn't have a voice that it says it with. It doesn't do it with words. But it does it in a way that everybody understands. We, we live in a world where we breathe oxygen and there are plants who take that oxygen and convert it back to 
I mean, not, we breathe, we breathe oxygen, we breathe out CO2, that takes the CO2, turns it back into oxygen, and gives it right back to us. That's amazing. You put more carbon in the air, that carbon gets taken and turned back into oxygen. Not only that, those plants feed us. That's pretty simple, right? All of us know this. Plants do feed us. They feed the things that feed us also. But you know what happens like in, within the forest? Within a, a tree? There's, this tree sits there in a forest with roots in the ground. And then it connects to the other trees in the forest. Through fungus. You know, uh, uh, this is how immensely complex the creation is, is that a tree in a forest could know that another tree has a disease or a bug and start putting up defenses because the other tree who has a disease and a bug tells the ground and, the, and the, all these little fibers going over to the rest of the trees, defend yourself so that they stay alive. There's a sun that rises every day. Rises and it sets. All of life is dependent on that sun. The further you are away from it, the closer we are to death. That's why we have winter. We're in the middle of it right now. It gets cold. The heat's gone. The leaves fall. Things go into hibernation. Why? To survive. No sun, no life. And then we come back closer, and the sun comes, and it brings life. It provides for the plants who are taking our carbon dioxide, who are taking up nutrients from the soil, who use the sun to convert it into energy so that they can do what they're designed to do. I mean, we could just spend all day talking about the crazy things that are in our world. Like a couple years ago, Right, it was Brood X with the locusts. That was fun. I moved to Delaware and there was a plague of locusts. But you know those animals live for like 13 or 17 years depending on the breed? And they live just so that they could come out and breed again. And they live underground where no one sees them. And then they come up because they're a delicious food source for birds and animals. And they all come up at the same time so that the life of the bug continues. And they don't just all get eaten and destroyed. So they get in our hair, they cover our driveway, all that stuff, because God designed them to do that. I mean, over and over and over, you can see this beautiful closed loop system that takes care of itself. And it would be a shame for us to sit there and think, that is God. That's the thing that I should worship. And the biggest star that we see, this sun that comes up and makes all this stuff happen, that should be the thing we should worship. And for some of you, it may seem crazy to say that. But for most of the world who did not have what we have, and in some way is a handicap that we have what we have, saw the glory of creation and determined there has to be something big or it's that thing up there that's going back and forth that I need to worship. Because there are things that are much bigger than I am. And so David, he's writing this psalm and he's showing, look, you, you, you can't worship the creation. It's not intended to do that. You're missing the point. This creation is it's, it's immense. It's huge. It's crazy. But it's designed to show us how big and wonderful and powerful God is. So there's voice goes out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them he set a tent for the sun, 
This thing that all life depends on. And it comes out like a bridegroom leaving its chamber. And joy. I mean, sunrises are awesome if you're able to wake up that early. They're just beautiful. Actually, there's studies now saying that, that uh, sitting and, and receiving the morning sun actually will help us with our sleep problems. Because our body would start getting signals from the sun that it's time to wake up now. And then when it sets, it tells our body it's time to go to sleep now. But we stare at screens and that changes everything. But the sun's good for us. We need it to create vitamin D for our body. The real good source of vitamin D, not the stuff that's just added in your milk. We need it for our health. We need it for our life. And it comes out, this beautiful, majestic, glorious thing comes out, goes across the sky, and it goes back to its tent to dwell. And David's writing this at a time when people were worshiping the God, worshiping the, worshiping the Son as God. In uh, Babylonian, uh, they called it the God Shemesh. And they believe he just came out every Every day, over, and he ruled over, and he brought life to the earth. So they worshipped him. And David's saying, no, no, no. It may look like a man rising and setting, but God is the one who's created it. God is the one who's made the house that it dwells in. God is the one who set the star in, in the sky. And has created it to provide what we need. That sun provides life for everything on the earth that it touches. God is the one who created the thing that is providing life for us. God is great. And we can see him in his nature. We can see him in the world. In fact, this is what Paul gets at in Romans 1. um, chapter, uh, Chapter 1, verse 18. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him, as God, or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and foolish, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And that's where most of our society is. The refusal to believe that there is a God who's created everything. The refusal to look at creation. I mean, we, we insulate ourselves from its dramatic effect somewhat. I mean, when's the last time you sat out and saw a starry, starry night sky? Like a big sky. Like you see out in mountains of Colorado where there's no lights. Anyone done that recently? Anyone have a recollection of that happening recently? Yes? What does it do to you? Makes you feel small. Makes you feel insignificant. Makes you wonder at what's going on there. It lets you see things as they actually are because we are small. We're not necessarily insignificant, but we are small. We're not the center of the world. I guess I I know I'm not. Hope you know that you're not. But we're, we're not, we think that we are. But we're not. And the creation is designed to get us to the point where we're saying there is something greater, something bigger, something who's created this immense creation. And that being is worthy of my worship. But we turn that into life is about me and my preference and my, what I want, how I view things. My hurt, my hang-ups, all these things, that's what life's about. We become fools. 
God's creation clearly expresses who he is. David transitions from this to God's word, which many commentators see as an abrupt change. But really, it's a natural change. Because what he's doing in his poetry here is he's saying, as the sun which God created gives life to the world around us, to the physical world, the word of God which is given to us gives life to our spirit. As the sun shines and revives the day, the word of God shines and revives our heart. So God's glory and his power is more clearly seen in his life-changing word. Verse 7. And I almost try to scroll my Bible, but... Um, the law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. So he goes from immensity of creation to the special revelation of God's word, which does six things and has an effect or has a certain value. So the six things he says it does, it's, it's perfect, it revives the soul. It's absolutely perfect. There's nothing wrong with it, nothing corrupted with it. It is absolutely perfect. And its effect is reviving the soul. The testimony or the law of the Lord, right? testimony, teaching, the law of the Lord, is sure. It can be relied upon. It's steady. It makes wise the simple. If you are simple and you need wisdom, go to the law of the Lord and just follow it. It will make you a wise person. Apply the word of God. It will make you wise. The precepts of the Lord, the commandments, the teachings, again, are right. They re rejoicing the heart. If you're depressed, if you're down, if you're upset with the ways and the decisions that you've been making in your life and you keep on making the wrong, wrong, wrong decisions, do what God is asking you to do and you won't have to carry that guilt. And you don't carry that guilt or that depression, that, which is usually anger towards what I, have not, what I have done in the past and I cannot resolve and I can't do anything with the anger, so then it turns into depression. Carrying the guilt. I can live rejoicing. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Enlightening the eyes. It makes me see things rightly. Like the sun helps me to see the world around me. So I don't trip over the Legos in my house. It lets me see things as they actually are. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. It lasts. It's tangible. It's not passing away. It doesn't break down. It's forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, which is something we're all looking for. Everyone defines good in their own way, but there is a good that people are striving after. And the real true good is found in God's definition of good. 
So what does David say? He says, because of all of this, the inherent value of the word of God is greater than anything this world can produce. The one who's created the world, the one who's put things in the world, he's put them in there for our enjoyment, but those things do not bring us fulfillment. So greater than the most valuable resource in the ancient Near East, gold, and greater than the most pleasurable resource in the ancient Near East, honey, it's better than those things. Right? They didn't have platinum. They didn't have Sour Patch Kids. These are greater than the things you want to strive for. Accolades, position, wealth, what you think is going to bring you comfort, it won't. But you can find the comfort, even if you don't have those things, by following the word of the Lord. Right? This is simple theology. You probably could have just got this by reading it yourself. But my desire here is to showcase who God is to you. He's the creator. He's the almighty. He's the one who's created everything. He is all powerful. He gives, has given us a resource to provide for the things, not just that are going to fill my stomach and keep my body working, but it's actually going to fill my being in a way that I have been looking for filling for my entire life. The thing that everybody is looking for, peace, reviving, joy, wisdom. It comes from God's word. His special revelation to us. So we seek it. Now, if those things are true, David comes to the only real response. Those who truly see God respond by humbly depending on the one who's able to rescue and redeem. Who can discern his errors? Verse 12. Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me, that I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my what? My rock and my redeemer. So David, just spending a little bit of time in creation, looking at the sun, reflecting about the sun, sees God is much greater than the sun. And if God's much greater than the sun, he's given us his special word. That God who made all those things actually spoke to us and gave us something from him that is not just the stuff that's out there, but it's very specific. And he's given it to me to grow and to change and to shape. What should my response be? Lord, help me. Like the sun illuminates the day and shows the hidden things where there's no shadow, depending on where it goes. Lord, you reveal in me the hidden faults of my life, the hidden sin that is besetting me, the hidden things that are in me that I, don't, I probably do know about, but I don't really want to discuss or, or confront in my life. Not only that, Lord, keep me from my presumptuous sins. What is that word? Willful. The things I know that I'm not supposed to do, I just do it anyways. Then I feel really bad about it, and I go a few days, and I don't do it again, and then I do it. And I go through this cycle. And I feel like I'm in bondage to this cycle. Lord, save me from those things that are damaging my life. I'm enslaved to They have dominion over me. I don't want them to have dominion over me. Lord, work not only in my actions, but in my thoughts and the things that I say. I want to be aligned with you. 
Now, there's a way to read this psalm that doesn't do what it's intended to do. That instead of the word of the Lord rejoicing the heart, it makes the heart more sick. There's a way of reading this and thinking that, you know what, I guess I don't have these things, and so if I just read this and I know all about it, I'm going to go get maybe a couple seminary degrees and maybe a PhD, then I'll have it all together and I'll have it all figured out. And you work and you work and you work and you work and you work, and then you're honest with yourself, I'm missing it. There's another way to read this that will bring its intended effects, but it comes through actually understanding what God is trying to do through his word here. Last week, Mark preached about Nicodemus. What was Nicodemus' problem? He couldn't see. He was like every other teacher of the law at that time. He could not see. The word became flesh and dwelt among men. Right? John starts out his gospel that way. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Everything that David's talking about, everything we could spend time looking at, everything was made through Jesus. And without him, nothing was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men. Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So when he was, actually I'll turn there, when, go to John 3. When Nicodemus was talking with Jesus, when he's having this discussion, you know, this is where the one most famous verse is, the one we're going to see while we're watching our football games, posted everywhere. John 3, 16, this is within the discussion of Nicodemus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only son. And this is the judgment. Listen to this. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their works are were evil. The teachers of the law, the Pharisees, those who were teaching what they were constantly, they, they knew the melody to this psalm. They'd sing it. They'd have it memorized. We're keeping it. There's great reward in keeping this. That's why we got the nice seats of honor. All you Publians, you know, Maybe one day you can be as righteous as I am. You've got to give all your money to, to, the, to the temple. And their deeds were evil. They were darkened in their understanding. They could not perceive the light. Actually, every time you see Jesus interacting with someone from that sect in the Gospel of John, with, starting with Nicodemus, what time of day is it? It's night. It's nighttime. Every time Jesus meets with someone who gets it, it's in the day. So two chapters later in chapter 5 when he meets with a woman at the well, what time is it? It is the middle of the day when the sun is the hottest. And the woman who has had, I forget, seven husbands, sees who the sun is is revived in her being, is enlightened in her understanding, and her eyes truly see. And it's those who have been thinking that if I just keep the commandments, if I just do what God's telling me to do, just keep on following these things, without the relationship, missed it. Basically, it continued to be 
about how I do what I need to do for me to be accepted. Rather than responding in humility like David did. I see all this, Lord. I see your great work. I see how immense your creation is, how beautiful it is, how much outside my ability to understand, we still have not figured out how to make the energy that the sun creates. How do we make that reaction? But you love me and care for me. Who am I that you look upon me? Lord, I know how much of a broken person I am. Would you please declare me innocent? Would you reveal what I'm doing that is, that is offensive to you? Would you shape and change who I am? Because what is the last statement? Lord, you are my rock and my redeemer. See, I think we, we read this psalm and we miss often the implications of what he's saying. You are my rock, meaning I can't stand steady on my own. You are a redeemer because I need redemption. What is redemption? Is being purchased or saved from something that's bringing me destruction or enslavement. Even when he's reading this, the law is perfect, reviving the soul. Why does he say he needs to revive the soul? Because we need revival. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise, simple, or the wise, making the simple wise. Why? Because we're foolish. We need to be made that. Precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Why do we need our heart to rejoice? Because our heart does not naturally rejoice. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Why? Because we need to see. That's our state. That's where we are. And even in that state, God gave to us what we needed to be revived out of where we were. There's another word for that. It's called grace. We don't deserve that. We don't earn that. We didn't work for that. It was given to us. And God's word throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament always speaks of God's grace towards mankind. It's not like there's a division where there's God of the law, angry old man in the sky, just telling me what I need to do to take away all my joy. And then loving, kind grandpa who gives me treats all the time. No, throughout all of scripture, there is holy, righteous, just, unapproachable, terrifying, immense God. who is rich in mercy, full of grace, forgiving iniquity, providing for sin, giving what our hearts truly desire to the ones who are willing to humble themselves and receive it. God deeply loves you. God deeply loves you. God deeply loves you. And you only grow in maturity when you understand the reality of that love. Yes, he's holy. Yes, he's immense. Yes, he's great. Yes, he's just. Yes, he's going to judge everyone because he's allowed to. He's the one who set up the rules. There is wrong. There is right. We have done the wrong. He still loves us. So much so that he did not send his, world, his son into the world to do what? Condemn the world but that the world would be saved through him. 
And he did not rescue you from your dead sins and trespasses to continue to condemn you. He rescued you so that he could save you. And he's committed to you. He's committed to working through you. He's committed to doing his life in you. Throughout your ups and downs. I mean, the Son of God spent three years with some men. They were idiots. I mean, even after Peter had this major thing where this beautiful image where God comes, Jesus meets with him specifically and three times says, I, I love, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Speaking right towards the three times he denied Jesus. Give you a chance to make it up, Peter. Go and feed my sheep. He goes out, does all these amazing things, and then he still messes up so much that Paul has to correct him. Well, I guess I gotta impress these people of circumcision. Gotta do these right things. I can't can't follow up. Peter, what are you doing, dude? Christ has freed us from the law. You don't have to get someone else's approval. You're already approved by God. You don't need the religious people to think highly of you. Don't do it. Continue to trust in the Lord. If you're wondering where that's at, it's in the book of Galatians. I'm not going to give you the actual place. Maybe you just read the whole book. It'd be really good. See, it's in understanding God's immense love for us. That's going to allow us to grow to maturity in what we believe. To find the hope that we need. To rest and experience these provisions. The, re- the reviving of our soul. The rejoicing of our heart. Yes, it comes from reading this. Yes, you need to be reading this. Yes, you need to be in this, but you're in this so that you may relate to him better. So my question I want to leave you with, and then we're going to get into communion, is this. How do I view God? Do I view him as someone who loves me this deeply? Do I view him as someone distant? who's constantly keeping track of all my faults and the Bible plan that I did not finish last year and the study that I said I was going to do and I didn't do and the 15 books I have on my shelf that I was going to use to increase my spiritual knowledge and my growing my walk? Or is he there because he loves us and he's just waiting to meet us? Someone pointed this out to me and it was, I have to go investigate it, but I'm going to say it now. Um, The only time you see God running in scripture is with the prodigal son sprinting towards his child God delights in his children he delights even more when they reach out in dependence on him it's our misunderstanding of who he is our misunderstanding of what the purpose of his word is that keeps us from dwelling in deep dividing relationship with him Let's view him as he is. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your spirit. The provision you've given to us. Lord, to confront the things in us that are not of you. To convict us of wrong ways. But Lord, we thank you that you have not come to condemn us, but you've come to take that condemnation upon yourself. So we ask that as this year begins, Lord, you would work in us a picture, a greater picture of who you are. That you would develop in us a deep love for you because of the love you've had for us. And that we keep your, your commandments, Lord, because of our love for you. We trust you and praise you in your name. Amen. Now we're going to start, um, men, if you want to go ahead and come up and grab uh, the elements. We're going to...
take a meal. It's called communion. It's a thing that Jesus has commanded us to do as we gather. And we do this at the first week of the month. It's a meal that helps us to remember the provision that God has given to us. Two elements, bread and wine or grape juice. Representing the broken body of our Lord and the shed blood of our Lord. We're called to do this constantly because it helps us to remember how much God loves us. When you chew and crush the bread in your mouth, it should remind you of the broken body of the creator of the universe who came and gave up his life willingly. He didn't need to. He doesn't need us. He wants us. And he loves us. And so as it's passed around and we're singing a song, I want you to spend some time in reflection on the gift that God has given to you and what that means for how he loves you. Amen.